A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, I will prove the holiness of my great name, profaned among the nations, in whose midst you have profaned it. Thus the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when in their sight I prove my holiness through you. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. You shall live in the land I gave your ancestors. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will pour clean water on you and wash away all your sins. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Give me back the joy of your salvation and a willing spirit sustain in me. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall return to you. For you are not pleased with sacrifices. Should I offer a burnt offering, you would not accept it. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Matteum. Jesus, again in reply, spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then the king said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads, and invite to the feast whomever you find. 
The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, bad and good alike, and the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there, not dressed in a wedding garment. He said to him, My friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he, is, he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Verbum Domini. see in the first reading today from the book of the prophet Ezekiel that the prophet is speaking to the Israelites who are in captivity and this is about 600 years or so before Christ. They were invaded by the Babylonians in 597, a group was hauled off and then again in 587 BC where they destroyed the temple. So Ezekiel is prophesying to this people held captive. They were taken off the land, right? The land that they were promised, that they were led out of uh, slavery in Egypt and brought to this land. They built a temple, uh, the Holy Land, of Jerusalem, and now they're in captivity. And so we have these great prophecies from Jeremiah and Ezekiel about restoration, about bringing the people back. And he says, today we hear, I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. Right? God's coming to liberate you, to free you. And we see here today in these passages in particular the promise of a new covenant, a new law that we hear in the gospel that is, comes to us in Jesus Christ that surpasses the old law, the old covenant. It, the new law, the gospel, brings to perfection, completion, these promises and images that we have in the Old Testament. The land, of course, is you know, a beautiful image of the kingdom. And we see that it is work of Christ and his Holy Spirit that fulfills all these promises, that brings them to this, uh, this newness and even beyond right, what was promised here in the Old Testament. That that God is, is faithful, you know, right? that's the message. The new covenant, the new law, the catechism says, takes these divine promises we hear in the Old Testament and orients them to the kingdom of heaven. So the land is an image of the kingdom, the temple is an image of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city we hear about and see in Revelation where God is fully present to his people. See, the whole Old Testament has this yearning, this ache for fulfillment. And, but we see clearly in the Old Testament, you know, this desire for conversion, that the prophets are always calling the people to a deep conversion. It's not enough just to physically be on the land, right? He wants their hearts in the right place. You know, we could say, what good is the land without this conversion? If we don't have this inner freedom, how can we live all the great gifts that the land that God wants to bestow upon them in this promised land. So that is all fulfilled in Christ. He says today, you shall live in the land, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Right? All this is a beautiful image of the relationship that we're called to have with God. He's called to be our father. He's revealed himself to the people, right? He's revealed his name. He calls them to communion with him. And that communion is going to be uh, fulfilled in Christ. It is his work and the work of the Holy Spirit that brings all this to completion. So he says, I will take you, right, from among the nations, that it's God's initiative, it's his work, it's his election for Israel and for us today. It's by his grace that we're saved. And he will, we're told today, I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you. He will forgive our sins, right? That's a beautiful image of the forgiveness of sins that we have through the sacraments, in particular, 
baptism. He says, I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, right? Replacing your stony hearts uh, with natural hearts, Ezekiel tells us today. So Jesus, through the gift of his Holy Spirit, gives us that Holy Spirit. We become temples of that Holy Spirit, and it affects this renewal from within, right? Christianity is about this inner transformation, this participation in the divine nature, inner transformation by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful image, a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, right? It's quite a dramatic difference, right? The saints tell us, St. Thomas tells us that, you know, this inner work of justification, forgiveness of sins and this gifting of the Holy Spirit is the greatest work of God, you know, greater than all creation, what he does within each one of us, you know, by making us new. He says, I will place my spirit within you so that you may live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. Right? We cannot fulfill the law of our own strength. We cannot live the law, the Ten Commandments, this is the heart of the law. We cannot live that just by my own determination. You know, I will give you, I will place my spirit within you so that you can live my statutes, right? We need his grace and his power, the power of the spirit to live the law. We need grace. We need God's help, his strength, his renewal. And we have to have that total dependence, that radical dependence on God, right? To be uh, his disciples. You know, not directing our own life, not telling God always what I need and how it needs to be, but we're to be following him, to have this radical dependence on God. That's, I think that's so hard for us to get, right? We want to stay in the driver's seat. Uh, we have this constant temptation to exalt ourselves and not to follow the Lord and not to depend on him, right? We want a security in ourselves, right? To stay in control. Our pride wants that, right? You say, I did it, right? This is my work. And it might just be implicit. We might not say that, but there's that tendency in us, right? To have that strength that comes from ourselves. And God's calling us to live by his spirit, right? That's what uh, Paul tells us in Galatians 5, to walk by the spirit, right? To avoid the sins of the flesh and to have these fruits of the Holy Spirit have his spirit operating in us and we have these fruits, these great you know, joy, peace, and love and things uh, that are fruits of that spirit. So we need to imitate Christ in his self-giving uh, to have that spirit you know, always operating in us. We hear in Psalm 51 today, the responsorial psalm, um, this great psalm of conversion and repentance. And this is absolutely necessary, right, that we have to turn from our sin and selfishness and self-centeredness and turn to, turn to God, right, to receive his spirit. He's not going to give us his spirit if we're hardened and seeking our own thing and seeking sin, right? That's how we close ourselves off from the spirit. So that's a first requirement that we be converted. We have this willingness to change, to do something different, you know, to be made new. And this psalm is so beautiful. These, they're almost like plaintive cries, you know, from his people. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me back the joy of your salvation. A willing spirit sustain in me. That's radical dependence on God. You know, even the desire for God, you know, is his gift, is his grace, that he moves us towards himself. I need a new heart to even want God. I gotta stay close to him to even have that desire for him, right? You ever experience that wrestling in your own life or even lose the desire for holiness at times? We grow cold, right? And our hearts become hardened. I need that, that joy of salvation, right? To appreciate his gifts, to want his gifts, to want to make him first in my life. I mean, to want that means a new heart. Right? So I need to stay close to his spirit to have that desire always green and fresh in me. His grace moves us and, and leads us to him. 
Give me back the joy of your salvation. We, we can lose that, right? When we drift along with the ways of the world and our sin and selfishness, we can lose that. And we need that breath of the Spirit to blow on the embers, you know, that burst into flame again. So we need God to renew us. We need, in a sense, to make, you know, to make us want him, uh, you know, to not let us grow cold, to walk by his Spirit, as I said, we hear in Galatians, to shun evil, to have charity in our heart, in our hearts and its works, right? The works of charity. You know, not too long ago, uh, Pope Benedict, in commenting on the gospel today, he quoted from St. Gregory the Great in saying that wedding garment that was necessary to enter and enjoy the feast is the works of charity. Gregory the Great would say this life of charity. And we can all do that. You know, no matter how we feel, we can do the works of charity that opens us up to the Spirit, this life of of giving, right? Not focused on myself and what I need and what I want and all that kind of stuff, but to look around and see the needs that are around us, the people that are around us, and give to them. What can I do to help them? That's how we capture again the joy of his salvation. That's how we have that Holy Spirit and his manner of working in us, right? As St. Francis would say, walking by the Spirit. So in the gospel today, we hear of this great wedding feast. And this, of course, is the parable of this great feast that God wants to have with humanity, that Jesus, the bridegroom, wants to have with his church. And the Eucharist is this banquet, this anticipation of the eternal wedding feast of the Lamb that we hear about in the book of Revelation, that we're all invited, right? Everybody is invited, that God is the king, he invites humanity to this banquet, and some refuse to come, and God goes down and burns the village, which is pretty stark. <laughs> but uh, we know there is a hell, right? We know there is a punishment. But God's goodness is inviting us to this relationship, to this communion with him, and some refuse to come. They mistreat his servants, we're told, right? We see that in the Old Testament, mistreating of the prophets. We see it oftentimes in the lives of the saints, the suffering, the persecution, how many martyrs there's been for Christ and his church, that is a reality, right, that we see played out in humanity, that there is a hardness in humanity that refuses to repent and to uh, come to this banquet, to come to the feast. And the wedding garment, oftentimes, other commentators, theologians tell us, church fathers, I believe, too, that you know, that wedding garment is, the, is an image of divine grace. And in baptism, we've received this sanctifying grace where sins are wiped away, we're made new. And if the wedding garment gets torn by sin, again, we can go to the sacraments through reconciliation, confess our sins, receive forgiveness, and be made clean. To come to the Eucharist and to receive his body and blood and to enjoy the feast. God has done everything for us. He calls us, he gives us that grace to be holy, to make us new. You know, we have to come with faith and be open to this transformation and to desire him, to want him with all our hearts.